I've been preaching here for a couple of Sundays, longer than that really, but uh, on this particular phase of the church, I've just called this series that I brought forth God's Strategy for the End Time Revival, dealing with certain things that has to take place in that vessel before that outpouring can ever happen. Now, we have dealt with this fact that we are the temple of God, that the only God life on this earth that can save or heal is in the church, in the believer, that God through us, God is everywhere, but nowhere does the Bible say that God lives in His cosmic world. He lives in His body. We are the body of Christ. Now, through the presence of that body and the omnipresence of God, God is everywhere. But the only power to deliver, to set free, is in us. This is what there has to be known. God dwelleth in us. Now, this morning I come again to read in the second chapter of the book of Acts, beginning with verse 16. The second chapter of the book of Acts, beginning with verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. I'll show wonders in heaven above, signs in earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Now, we just noted in lesson last that when Peter said, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel, we noticed and knew but noted particularly that the same Holy Ghost that wrote the Old Testament wrote the New, and the same one that wrote the New wrote the Old. And the prophet Joel said it shall come to pass afterward. The apostle Peter said it shall come to pass in the last days. Now the study of eschatology is a study of the end time. And the word used by the prophet Joel was a word eschator, which means the last days. But eschaton is used by the apostle Peter this is all according to Mr. Strong. I don't know these things in myself. Meant the culmination of those last days. That after the last days, Peter said, God would send forth an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that was going to touch all flesh. And that word flesh, as used there, means humanity. Not just the church, but all humanity. The pouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, for that to happen, the vessel through which it comes has to be renewed. There has to be a renewal of the church itself the, before the world can experience the revival that we read about. This is what the Apostle Peter writing, preaching on the birthday of the church, was able to see beyond and to see that the church was going to pass through a time when everything was going to be lost, the Bible said that the heavens had received Christ until the time of the restitution of all things. Now that's not the restitution of the earth, but the restitution of that church to its spiritual position that it was when it was born. 
Now, if the Holy Spirit revealed, that church was born full-grown. It wasn't born with one gift looking for eight others. It was all there in the birth of that church, just like Adam was born with every faculty of his being and an intellect that has the ability to name every animal on this earth. That church born on the day of Pentecost was filled with God. But the Holy Spirit saw time when that would all be taken away, but would be restored in those days prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the cry of unity in the church today has nothing to do with what we're talking about. God never intended the church give up anything. I'm listening to this unity cry, and they're telling us that we're going to have to give up what we believe to unite with the Jehovah Witness and Mormons and Romanism and everything else. I'm telling you that they're the ones going to have to give up and have to if there's going to be any uniting. It's always been a remnant. That's always through the Bible. It has been a remnant that God has always wound up with. The closer Jesus got to Calvary, the less people that were following him. As long as it was the loaves and the fishes, then the multitude are there. But when he came to Calvary, you can about count all of them on one hand. And so it is when it begins to come that it costs something. Then the tares are separated from the wheat. And we begin to see what's going on while today God is renewing that vessel through which this outpouring upon all the flesh has to come. The vessel has to be renewed. Now how is God going to prepare and renew that end time church? Is going to take up the discussion today. How is that going to happen? What is God's strategy for this seeming impossible task of producing a vessel through which he can pour himself? I know we pass through a lot of things, and uh, there's a lot of mutations taking place in the church. I, 41 years ago, came into this Pentecostal way, and I heard a message that I believe today that God will not dwell, much less use, an unclean vessel. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord, was the first verse that I memorized. Not that I took the Bible and memorized it, but it was so often repeated that it registered on the plastic cell of my brain. They are not legalists, ladies and gentlemen. They were men and women that walk with God. They were extreme, not to be sure, but they weren't trying to find out how close they could walk with the world and make heaven, but how far they could get away from the enemy of God and please the Almighty. This was the message of Pentecost that I was birthed into. Now, what is it going to take to renew that vessel so that God can pour himself through it? Now, we who make up the last day church are like Zechariah in the fourth chapter of a book that's called by his name. We are at that. We can see, number one, that what God has is a mess, most part, religiously, across this land and around the world, that what he has and what he wants is two entirely different things. When God touched Zechariah, said he waked him as a man out of a deep sleep. Then he asked him, what do you see? Now, he wasn't taking a nap, but he was asleep spiritually. He was like most of the world drugged with religion. I've heard Brother Schambach say that just enough religion to keep him from taking the real thing, like inoculating a man for smallpox. All you do is just give him enough smallpox so he won't uh, uh, contact the main thing. And this is pretty well the way that it's been with religion. And what Zechariah saw was a candlestick all of gold. Now that candlestick is a church. Gold is pure. And what he saw was a church all of God. But he also saw what God had. A mass full of idolatry. He saw and his heart fainted within him. I believe that's where we are.
when my spirit is made to see by the Holy Ghost and by the Word of God what God is after. I look at the book of Acts and see the church. Then I look at what's happening to that church today. And I know what God wants. It's a staggering thing to look at it. But I must be reminded that it's not by might nor by power. Man cannot build this church with all of his books and all of his talk. Man cannot build this church. What is impossible with man is nothing with God. But we are to be the instruments of that purpose. Not only is the church the purpose of God, but it is the instrument through which that purpose is formed. I am a part of that church, but yet I'm the instrument that God will use in producing that church. I must know that. The church must know. What must we do then to bring this instrument into the place that God can use it for this end time revival that I read about? Well, first of all, the old man has got to dream. I've made mention a little bit. I want to deal with this thought. The old man has got to dream his dreams. There's never going to be that revival until that dream. Now, who are the old men? The, old, the Hebrew word for old man is presbyteros, or the one we get presbyter from, or the one we get the overseer. Amen. It is the word for beard. Beard. It says, listen, we, we, we are the old, who are they? It's a word for beard. The anointing all came upon Aaron's head and ran down upon his beard. Who was Aaron? He was a mouthpiece for Moses. Isn't that right? He was a mouthpiece for Moses. He was the old man. He had to be the mouthpiece. He heard what Moses was saying, and he had to say it to the people. Who is the chief cornerstone? Jesus. He is full of oil, but his old man must be his mouthpiece. There has to be those that hear what he's saying. There's got to be that human or those humans on this earth that hear what God is saying. There can no longer be just a studying and a finding something to inspire. But somebody has to get in there. Somebody has to hear what he's saying. I said as that Old Testament tabernacle was the skin tent for God. It was God that lived in there. And Jesus, when it said he became flesh and dwelt among us, it meant he become the skin tent of the covering of God. And what that Old Testament tabernacle and that Old Testament temple was, what Jesus was, the church is where the holy of holies, God lives in us. We must somehow, somebody has to hear what he's saying. The Bible said that Jesus said, I don't say anything. But what I hear my father say, I'm not up here making religious noise. I'm not up here trying to find what you want to hear. I'm here in the name of God. I'm in the presence of God. I'm here to say what God once said. The old man. Amen. The old man. When God is ready to pour out his spirit, his old men are going to dream dreams. I said, they're going to dream dreams, and they're going to bring that word back. They're going to bring it back clear and pure to the body of Christ. We can be sure that this is the word. For Peter said, this was spoken by the prophet Joel. The Holy Ghost said to Joel, this is what's going to happen. Now, this is the word of the Lord. Now, the word old man in Acts 2 is the word from which we get the word presbyter or overseer. Men full of the Holy Ghost who oversee the work of God. Now, I don't oversee the work of God worldwide. But I can tell you one thing. I'm here by the appointment of God in Beaumont, Texas. I'm not here this morning looking for success but approval. I want to stand there and hear from God and come back to this pulpit and proclaim what God is saying. It doesn't matter whether the community wants to hear. It's not what they want. It's what they must hear. 
I left this church a lot of years ago. And when I was going home, they had that exorcist on. That, that, that demon-possessed movie, they made it a lot worse. But that was a, a real controversial thing. And on the way home over here, they had a line outside that theater, standing in line to get there. And I noticed, too, they looked very familiar. I went over to this couple of boys of this church. And I said, you get out of this line. I mean, they turn, why does this shirt I'm wearing? <laughs> oh, somebody said, I suppose they don't want to hear that. I said, it doesn't matter what they want to hear. It's what they need to hear. Oh, no, I'm not looking for what you want to hear this morning. I'm trying under God to get into that place where God is. Oh, hallelujah. Hear what he says and then come back to this pulpit and proclaim it like a man from another world to say what God is saying. That's what an old man is. Listen, that's what he's not talking about, somebody on a cane, but he's talking about those that hear from God. The requirement of an old man in the kingdom is to see what God sees and to say what God says. Oh, hallelujah. It is to be able to see what God is saying and to say what God is saying in these last days. Listen, the Hebrew word for prophet is N-A-B-Y. Now it's pronounced according to strong Nabi, N-A-W-B-W-E. And it's based on another Hebrew word, seer. Now seer is one who sees beyond the natural. He sees what other people don't see. God has to have somewhere some old man that can see what's not being seen. I'm tired of the snake oil. I'm tired of demon-possessed Christians. I'm tired of those that don't even know God talking about God. Somebody has to press in there. Somebody has to hear what he's saying. The church is never going to be renewed until that church hears what God is saying. I've read all the books, Seven Steps to Healing, Church Growth Seminars. I'm not interested. I can tell you we was reading yesterday about some kind of a deal they were having. They had 101 different workshops, but one of them said how to hear what the Spirit said. We said to each other, that's all we need. If we hear what he's saying, ladies and gentlemen, you can throw out all the other books. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I've wore out my knees looking through commentaries. I've come to learn it isn't a pretext. It isn't in a pretext. It's in the context. Thank God it's a taking a hold of this book and comparing spiritual with spiritual, going into the presence of God, hearing what the Almighty has to say. Glory to God. A seer, the seer sees the throne room of God, comes back like Moses with a shine on his face. This is what he's saying in Ezekiel 43. Everything of God is destroyed. The city is level. The temple is gone. Nothing left. But God takes a man out of captivity, carries him back there in the spirit, and in a vision. An old man is a dreaming. You hear me? I said, an old man is a dreaming. In that vision, Ezekiel saw that temple in its restore. He saw a river coming out of it. My God, healing everything it touched. He saw the banks lined. Listen, he saw the banks lined with trees. Trees in the Bible are men. That's Holy Ghost men and women drawing their roots into the river of God. He saw those trees, the leaves of healed the nation. He saw a river coming out of that temple. That's not the Millennium Temple. That's a church, ladies and gentlemen. And he saw it, my God, that you're healing everything. And then God said to him, I want you to go back now. And I want you to preach to them what you saw. I want you to show them what you saw. Oh, my God. God, we need somebody to press in there and to see Christ one more time. Come back here and tell this sick world what we saw. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Old man has to dream those dreams. I said the old man has to dream those dreams. In there, in there, 
before God, hearing what the Almighty has to say, bringing it back like Moses with a shine on his face. The seer goes back, and one of the words in the, in the, in the Bible used for prophet is Navi, N-A-V-I. One is seer, the other Navi, however you pronounce it. But the word literally means preach till he foams at the mouth. My God, Mr. Lincoln, when president said, when I hear a preacher preach, I want him to preach like he's fighting bees. Amen. I want him convinced. Hallelujah. Banker said to me one Monday morning, he said, I don't know whether I believe what you preach or not, but my God, I believe you believe it. Hallelujah. Oh, oh yes. Hallelujah. I believe you believe it. Come back. Go into that presence. Hear what God is saying. Come back. Preach till you foam at the mouth. My God proclaim this thing with a fanaticism that men cannot ignore. Oh, listen, old men dream dreams. One of the meaning of a dream is on the inside, a divine hypnosis. A, a divine hypnosis on the inside. Amen. It just simply means that God is so calm that my senses don't matter anymore. Whatever else I'm hearing doesn't matter. Or whatever else I'm seeing doesn't matter. I've been there and I heard. It doesn't make any difference to me, ladies and gentlemen, if the whole world's going that way. I've seen God going this way. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> my God, I'm a looking in the right direction. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, he, he sees, he comes back to tell. I said he comes back to tell. And a divine hypnosis, my natural hearing, seeing, talking, doesn't matter anymore. No, no, I'm caught up in God, and God is infilling me. I'm hearing something from heaven. There's a note being sounded. There's a new message that's not new with God. It's just God working backwards to the original. But it's new to a world, that, to a church world, that's 85% tares or more. A church that doesn't know God and has grew up on a message that had nothing to tell them but what God wanted to do for them. Never took time to deal with what God wanted out of them. Preached a message that promised everything and cost nothing. And because we're Pentecostal, we have to produce. We're Pentecostal. A woman calls me and says, are you the pastor I see in Austin on TV? Yes. Well, I said, I heard you say God can do anything. Want me to raise a boy from dead, been dead 18 months. Listen, you got to perform, you see. The Baptists, the Methodists, they preach a God that was and a God that will be, but in between there's a blank. We just talk about what used to be, what's going to be. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wistful eye. But in this Pentecostal world, ladies and gentlemen, we're saying I'm a camping in Canaan. <laughs> My God, what I'm saying is... We have to produce what we preach. So we have the curse of imitation. I said we have the curse of imitation. We teach them how to fall out. We have catchers. We teach them how to talk in tongues. We have little girls spinning around showing the bloomers, dancing for us. My God, my God, somebody has to go in there. Somebody has to hear what God is saying and come back and proclaim this to a lost world. Old men dream dreams. Oh, listen, from that divine hypnosis, I come to preach till I foam at the mouth. So the first step, getting ready, to the church ready for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the world is for old men to get inside the holies of holies with God. Oh, see what God sees. Hear what he hears. Then like Ezekiel, come back and proclaim it to the church. Come back and proclaim this to the church. God through the old men will raise up young men and women that will see the vision. Hallelujah. I said he'll raise up the young that will see the vision. Listen to me. The old man has to dream that dream. Young men 
have to see the vision. Hallelujah. Listen, a vision means the dream of the young man. That a vision means rather a piece of the dream of the old man. A young man takes a hold of that piece of dream and God sets it on fire in his heart. He burns with that vision. Amen. He hears that old man as he crawls at the mouth. And God takes a piece of that dream, puts it in that spirit, and he goes forth to burn. Let me tell you something, folks. There ain't many folks going to come watch an old man dream, but they'll come to watch that young man burn. Hallelujah. I said they'll come to watch him burn. And a vision is a taking a hold of that dream. The old man dreamed, the young man burns. The world won't come to watch us dream, but they'll come to watch it. If God would ignite those sitting here to burn, listen, wherever he's put us, God pours himself through them, servants and handmaids. Now the Hebrew word for this, servants and handmaids, is evid. The Greek word is doula. Paul called himself a doula. That's a bond servant. That means a servant that's not hired. He has come to a time that he can be free if he wants to. But he says to that master, I love you. I don't want to be free. I'm going to stay here the rest of my life. What does he do? He takes him. Listen. He takes him down to the temple, puts him up against the pillar, puts a hole in that ear. Now, to be a bond servant, the man would go and say these things. When he put that hole in his ear, then two things happened when a man made that commitment. Number one, he lost his last name. No longer R.W. Shambach, R.W. Jehovah, you lost your name. And if a man don't have a name, he can't sign for property or nothing else. That simply means he's signing for another, that you owe nothing. Own oh, nothing. You're a slave. You're a bond servant. And you lost your name in that deal. It's no longer what you were. You now have become a servant of this one for life. You lost that name. You no longer can have any possession. Everything you have or hope to have belongs to that Lord that put that hole in your ear. But it meant the second thing, that no matter how prolific that man was, his offspring were not his. No, no. They belonged to God. I want to tell you something. This is the most encouraging thing when I begin to see here. I, I can tell you I've saw that which is almost hopeless. I've, I've dealt with some of those servants and handmaids that I thought never going to make it. But I begin to realize more and more the responsibility that's ours. You see, we are always beaten on that altar. We are the people. We Pentecostal people. We are the ones that are saying all things are the same since the Father fell asleep. I can tell you, he's not asleep. We beat on an altar. Oh, God sent a revival. He said, I've already sent it. Amen. I put it inside of you. Then he said, let your light so shine. You know what he's saying? That it's possible to have this in you and nobody know anything about it. Let your light shine. If if my people will, I will. If Zion will prevail, she'll bring forth her children. I've watched this bring forth illegitimate half-breed because it's brought forth without travail. Oh, we figure it out. We got the psychology. We can stir a man up and get him to make commitment to see his mom in heaven, keep him from going to hell. We've got all of the tools. But if they're not birthed out of travail, they're half-breeds, and the church is cursed. You see the responsibility. I remember that a service altar prayer meeting one morning. God said to me, there are people in hell because you didn't travail. You're responsible for being there. Let me tell you, that'll wake you up. You may be drowsy, but that'll wake you up. Folks are in hell because you never travailed. You see, well, that, that responsibility, that responsibility. I look at the sons and daughters, the servants that God said is going to prophesy. Amen. It seems hopeless. And you have a lot of the church wanting to write them off. Amen. But then you begin to realize it isn't God. You beat on the altar, send a revival. He said, I've already sent it. It's in you. Amen. I live in you. If you don't release it, then nothing's ever going to happen. 
But he said, look, he said, the sons, daughters, the handmaids, brother, and the servants are going to be the ones to prophesy. Listen at it. When the old man dreams, amen, the young men burn, sons and daughters of the king, and you know that gum chewing, fingernail uh, filing bunch, that bunch that they don't think mamas are looking to slip out the back door. I got three or four of them kind that are preachers today. You hear me? Amen. I used to sit up here and see what mama couldn't see. I'd see them get up, look around. She's not looking. Slip out that door and go off, come back just before the meeting was over. Amen. They wrote them off. Those bars are hopeless. But I see them preaching today. You hear me? If that old man will, will dream, that young man will burn. I'm telling you, they'll prophesy after a while. My God, there's got to be a reality. Young men and women prophesying as a result, listen, of reality. These whom the church has wrote off, when they get touched by the fire, the dross is burned away. Amen. The thing that you thought couldn't happen, happens. Sons and daughters are going to become servants and handmaids in whom God is going to pour out the Holy Ghost. These are the ones the Bible says will prophesy. Now when this happens, they begin to act like the old man, foaming at the mouth with the glory of God. Hallelujah. I said they begin to act like the old man, foaming at the mouth with the glory of the living God. When God's church is made up of people like this, you don't care who gets the glory. Can you say amen? Doesn't matter. They're willing to turn it over to God, saying, take my name off. I don't have a name anyway. At this point, they start pouring out of His glory. So the whole earth will see, feel, and hear. Then there'll be the miracle in the sky, blood, fire, vapors, our smoke. That's what we must know. That's what we've got to do. But there's something we've got to have in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7 says we already have it we have this treasure we have this treasure think about it the thing that we seek if we're his we already have we have this treasure now if we have it where is it why is it not manifest he said, we have this treasure, Paul says, in 2 Corinthians 4 and 7, in earthen vessels, clay pots. You know what God wants? Some cracked pots. Amen. Oh, yes, sir. My God, he's tired of this whole life being tied up in you and me. Yes, sir. I never read a greater book in my life. Robert gave it to me a lot of years ago. I never had heard of Watchman Nee to that point in time. And he gave me a book, uh, uh, The Release of the Spirit. And I began to read that book. I wept through most of it. As that man of God dealt with all of God's dealing with you is to break you, to wound you. There's something in you got to come out. And it can't come out till you're wounded, till you're broken, until you're crushed. I made the statement here that Jesus never went from the streets of Jerusalem. He never went from the streets of Jerusalem to Calvary. He went to Gethsemane, the place of crushing. And when he come back from there, he could weep over Jerusalem. You listening? I said he could weep over Jerusalem. He said, we have this treasure in clay pots. Amen. We have this treasure, the life, the hope of the world, ladies and gentlemen, the hope of your neighbor, the hope of men being healed, the hope of men being saved is in these clay pots. Amen. The treasure is in the clay pot of our carnality. And one way or another, God is going to crack that pot. If you'll obey him, cooperate with him, God can work. But if you don't, he will work anyway. One way or another, he's going to crack this pot. Because that's where the life is. That's where it's at. We, like Jesus, pass, pass through our own Gethsemane. Amen. The place to be crushed or broken that the treasure may pour out, that the treasure may come forth. We must, listen, there must be, there must be that place of breaking. You see that word geth is the first word. That's a place of crushing. That's simony. 
That comes from the same word. That deals with the Holy Ghost, the seed of God, like the seed of a human and the seed of man, but it deals with that seed. And that crushed vessel becomes that which God can pour His life through to the womb of this world. And it's a place where that one that's been touched can come back through to God. Amen. The church was birthed on the day of Pentecost. And I can tell you, you can talk about the Old Testament church if you want. There wasn't no such a thing there. Say it any way you want to. Israel was a type of a lot of things. But she wasn't what God was after. The unique thing of history is the body of Christ. There never was such a thing, ladies and gentlemen, until the day of Pentecost. There never was such a thing until the day of Pentecost. That is what we have become, us, you, me. We are the body of Christ. It is through us that Jesus lives. And if it can't live through us, then it will never know him. The church was birthed 2,000 years ago. God's Holy Spirit set upon it and imposed the purpose of the vessel. Then filled that vessel. And from then till now, if men deal with God, they got to deal with Him through that church. This, you see, like Jesus, walking this earth as a man, He was the dwelling place of God, the skin tent of God, that word dwelleth, the skin tent of God. He was a place. God lived there. That Old Testament, He clothed Himself with fire and smoke and dwelt in that old skin-covered tabernacle, ugliest sin on the outside. God lived in there. The Bible said it was a tabernacle of witness. Ever he that knew, God was in there. What that old tabernacle was, what Jesus was, we are. We're the holy of holies. So sad, though, that life can be in you, and men not even know that it's there. You see, the pot has to be broke. A broken and a contrite spirit he'll not despise. The sacrifices of the Lord is a broken and a contrite spirit. It isn't how eloquent you are. It isn't how well you can pray. It isn't the words you say. But the attention of God is only captured by the state of your being. Here is a man that I look to. He that trembleth at my word. He that is of a broken and a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. The vessel has to be crushed and broken that the treasure may pour out. What is the treasure? It's the Holy Ghost and fire. It's what the world needs. It's Jesus. I said it's Jesus. It's Jesus. He's come to take the things of Christ and manifest them in a world. And that can never happen apart from the Holy Ghost. All of your learning won't do that. Only this Holy Spirit working through that crushed and broken vessel. On that day, 120 people climbed the steps of that upper room. They were dead men. Over 500 had heard him say, wait right here. Don't you go anywhere until you've been endued with his power. 280, 380 rather disappeared into the night. They counted the cost. It's not worth it. It's signing your own death warrant to climb those steps to the upper room. The same people that murdered him are waiting to murder them. And they climbed that steps, mister. They, their hope is in a world they've never seen. That doctor's patients have found another doctor. Somebody's already stole the boat and the fishing nets have rotted. The tax collector is an outlaw as far as that mafia is concerned. There's no way to return, mister. That's a broken, bruised and peeled vessel that climbed those steps. They put their hope in him, now he's gone. They've watched him disappear. And they climbed those steps and it was into that broken vessel that Pentecost came the first time. Now it's here. That vessel has to be broken. That message, let your light shine, says that I have a light. And I'm going to be held responsible if it shines or doesn't shine. The old man must dream and come back and proclaim it 
was a man from another world. The young man must take a hold of a part of that dream as his vision and burn with it. Then the gum chewing crowd, the ones seem so disinterested, are be the ones that prophesy. And through that vessel, all humanity will somehow feel the effect. They'll not all be saved any more than there was then, but they'll feel the effect of this Holy Spirit on all flesh. Bow your head with